I didn't, hadn't, had only heard of, of Lyle prior to our Mounds and Migrants tour last year. And getting the opportunity to spend a week with him on the road with 24 other folks, uh, I was super impressed with this young man. So he has uh, been trained at uh, Northern Arizona University. He grew up at Hopi on Third, third Mesa at Hot Villa and has a broad, I mean, his concepts of uh, his approach to archaeology very much fit into our preservation archaeology um, approach to our profession. And it was a wonderful week to get that opportunity to spend with Lyle. And I'm honored to be able to introduce him to you here tonight to spend about an hour uh, talking about some of the things he's been doing um, down in Grand Canyon. So Lyle, it's all yours. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for all coming in and spending the evening here. And also thank you to um, Desert Archaeology and Archaeology Southwest for allowing me the opportunity to come down and share a little bit of who I am and what I do. Um, you know, this is uh, my first time doing this type of uh, cafe archaeology. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, came down from Hopi. This morning, you know, beat the traffic, got here in time. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we might as well just get right into it. You know, we have a little bit of time left. And again, like questions will come uh, whenever they arise somewhere down the line. Again, my name is Lyle Belinqua. The only um, correction I have to Bill's good introduction is that I'm from the village of Bakavi on 3rd Mesa. I don't want to be associated with those Hovela guys. You know, so. <laughs> and I know this is on video and they'll see it. So, but it's just a, it's just a joke. We're neighbors, you know, we're about a mile apart in, in that regard. And so uh, a lot of my relatives live just right across the road. And so um, it's a good natured ribbing that we give one another. Um, my background is in archeology. span I have my bachelor's and master's from Northern Arizona University. Uh, I graduated in 1999 and 2002. And uh, my start in archeology span really began when I was a little kid. And I didn't even know it growing up then because um, I'm fortunate. I tell people that I come from a family of ranchers and farmers and hikers and hunters and fishermen. And so we're always out on the landscape from the time I was born, basically. And there isn't a place that you cannot go out at Hopi and <clears throat> come across artifacts, archaeology, you know, and, and it's literally right out there uh, at our front doorstep. And so growing up as a kid, um, you know, nowadays kids have a, a different lifestyle. Back then, I was literally pushed out the front door uh, during the summer and on weekends and told to go explore the back, the, wherever, you know, go wander. And so we would take um, our BB guns, our 22s, uh, maybe some potatoes wrapped in tin foil, and take off, knowing that there were springs along the way that we could get water from, knowing that there was animals that we could hunt knowing that there was other plants that we could eat. And so we were pretty sustainable out there, just kind of having our, our day out in the back country, so to speak. Inevitably, you know, we've come across um, this archaeology, right? It'd be rock art, there'd be pottery, there'd be small ruins out there. And we'd, we were never taught to fear them, so to speak. We were always taught that they were a part of who we are and where we come from. And so at the end of the day, right, we'd come back home and be sitting around the family dinner table and <clears throat> our relatives would ask us, where did you go, what did you see? And so we were able to retell our adventures for the day, well, this is what we saw over to the west or this is what we saw up on, you know, we went to this spring with these rock art and they would relate to us stories of what that meant. And so we got a little bit of cultural history then and we did not know it at the time, but we were becoming archeologists, so to speak. They were planting that seed in us um, to learn and, and remember our history. So you fast forward a number of years, there I am in, in high school, uh, about ready to transition into the university setting, which happened. Uh, the, the most important part during that time is I was becoming a lot older in terms of assuming more cultural responsibilities out at Hopi. So a lot of what my parents had told me as a kid was becoming to be more concrete and make have a bigger profound effect and understanding in my life. 
you know, I tell people that as a, as a child, I never got to go to Disneyland <clears throat> or to SeaWorld or to those places. My parents would put me in the truck or the car and we'd go to places like Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon and Wapatki. And so I was exposed to that continually every summer. And when we would go to these places, we, you know, we'd walk around the ruins and read. We're just like any other visitor, right? Reading the trail brochure. But along the way, my father or somebody in my family would relate to me that you are related to these people that lived here. Again, as a little kid, I did not truly understand all the complexities that was tied up in that until much later in life, until I started to assume greater responsibility within Hopi culture itself. And so about high school, I started to get a good understanding and transitioning into the university setting wasn't easy for me. Um, I failed at a lot of different subjects that I tried to um, undertake. I pretty much tried every single major in the university setting the first two years and was about ready to just do away with college. It wasn't for me. I probably had a 1.5 GPA or something. It was, you know, it was down in the dumps and I was on academic suspension, probation. Um, I didn't see a future in archaeology or university setting for me. Things come to pass in life where you come to crossroads like that and opportunities seem to come out of nowhere. And it just so happened that uh, there was a, a NAU professor, a NAU anthropology professor by the name of Miguel Vasquez, who was teaching some work down in my village. I didn't happen to know that he was down there. It was my father who said, hey, there's some people doing some work down in the Springs area. At the time, I was in concrete and construction work as well, working with my hands, doing uh, masonry block, doing sandstone uh, pavement, building fireplaces and things like that. So the work they were doing really spoke to me in terms of the work I was doing on a side job. I got to talking with uh, Dr. Vasquez about this and that and he asked me, well, what are, you, what are you pursuing? And I pretty much told him that, you know, I'm, I'm not planning on going back. I'm going to go back to my, my construction because I was making good money and I was happy doing it. Uh, it was something where you could start a project at the beginning of the day and by the end of the day you could see your progression and so that type of uh, stimulation was really appealing to me he said well you know if you ever decide to come back you know why don't you consider uh, anthropology and at the time i was getting pressure from my mother as well to stay in school she did not want me to drop out she wanted me to continue on in my education so I acquiesced to her wishes and continued on in my schooling, <clears throat> not really knowing what I was going to do. Eventually, I rehooked up, uh, got reacquainted with Dr. Vasquez, and started taking anthropology. Uh, just then, again, another opportunity to get involved in a ruins preservation program with the National Park Service came about, and that was dealing with preservation of ancestral uh, sites like at Wapatki, and so. We spent a summer doing that, traveling around the Southwest, learning different masonry techniques, which was, again, what I was doing in my construction work. So all those things kind of came together, and ultimately, 10 years later, you know, I walked out of NAU with a master's degree. So it's a real kind of you know, brief history of how I became involved in, in archaeology and anthropology, um, and it's continued to this day. Now. What I've been able to do with that experience and education has led me into other realms of career and life that I had never expected that I would be able to do. So in May of 2002, I walked across the stage and received my master's degree and walked off. Went home, had a, had a celebration dinner, packed my bags, went back to work to the Park Service the next day, and they drove me up to Lee's Ferry. And they dropped me and a couple other archaeologists off and put us on a raft with other Park Service archaeologists and sent us on a 21-day trip down the Colorado River. So that was my first trip ever. I had, as a kid, you know, uh, my girlfriend and I were just up there the other day at Lee's Ferry. I grew up fishing at Lee's Ferry, you know, and there's a little ways down past the dock. It's Perea Riffle. You look at it from the shore, it's not much of anything. There's a little bit of white caps and a little bit of splash here and there. As a little eight-year-old kid, that was terrifying to me. This little, it looked like huge waves to me from the shore. 
And so I have to laugh nowadays when, when I go up there and get on boats to do these trips. I cross that Priya Riffle every time when I retell this story about how I was terrified of this back in the day and here I am going into a whole other realm of, you know, work. So that sparked my interest. We spent 21 days in the canyon doing archaeology uh, along the river corridor. It really didn't come back to me until about five years later. Um, during that time in between, I stayed with the Park Service. Uh, I then left and I went to the Hopi tribe and I was the archaeology program manager for a while. That really didn't suit me. I was 30 years old. Um, I wasn't ready to sit in the office <clears throat> and be a manager all day. I wanted to be out in the field doing field work. And so I left, you know, much to the dismay of some folks there at the tribe, I made the decision to go out on my own. And so in 2007, I embarked upon this whole other realm of being an independent consultant. And again, opportunity came up um, in the spring of 2007. I met uh, a Navajo lady by the name of Nikki Cooley. And she had been working as a river guide in the Grand Canyon with another company, Arizona Raft Adventures. And she had been putting together, uh, in the process of putting together, a training program for Native Americans to enter the realm of river guiding. And through acquaintances, we got connected, and I applied to the program and was accepted. And then we spent 10 days up on the San Juan River doing a training trip. From there, I just kept going. You know, I, I really, um, it, it's something that spoke to me as a person, uh, the physicalness of it. Uh, being outdoors, and also being able to utilize my archaeology background. If any of you have been on a San Juan River trip, you know how much archaeology is up there. And if you haven't, come talk to me afterwards and we'll all go down again, you know. So um, I was blown away with, with what I was seeing up there. You know, of course, I was blown away with what I saw down in the Grand Canyon. I'm blown away with any new archaeology site that I go to. It's just that part of me that... Um, you crave to learn more about who these people are, and knowing that you have some ancestry connected with them means a lot more to you. It, it makes it much more tangible. And so since 2007 is when I really started guiding on a full-time surface during the summers. And so I just kept picking up trips here, picking up trips there, uh, got my San Juan guide license, started working for NAU. They have a river program um, and started running various rivers. Uh, the Colorado, the San Juan, uh, the Gila and the Sal and the Verde River. And so over a period of 10 years now, you've got this experience of running these different rivers. And so, you know, tonight's talk really is about what do, what do those rivers mean to us in Hopi? And what is, the, what is the purpose of a person like me being out there, right? It's more than just having fun. So there was a huge difference in my introduction and in my experience doing river trips. It wasn't just solely to take passengers down the river. That's of course part of my job. But the other part of it was utilizing that landscape, that cultural landscape out there of learning more about who I am. So I'm very fortunate that I come from family that places a high value on remembering our history. And so I was able to learn a, a lot during my archaeology career when I was in the university setting, when I was working for the Park Service. And then since then, uh, they've been very, very good about teaching me what all this area means. I know you probably really can't see this very good, and we'll leave this up and maybe you can come check it out later. But, you know, it's an image of the four corners. And so up here in this blurry spot is Utah, and down here is Arizona and New Mexico and Colorado, right? So. From a Hopi perspective, you know, people always ask us, well, you know, what is ancestral Hopi land? They look at the map today and it shows 1.6 million acres somewhere down here. You know, that's a political boundary. That boundary is arbitrary to us. It doesn't mean anything. Our cultural knowledge is such that it, it wipes that boundary off the map. And from a Hopi perspective, this is considered all ancestral land. And it can expand into much greater lands when you ask uh, various clans, their history, because, you know, Hopi is uh, comprised of various clans, and that's our social organization. These clans, and there's another long history behind that that I won't really get into, just because it's, it's going to take up a lot more time, but, you know, the clans traveled throughout the Southwest, right? They were kind of following divine instruction. 
And during those migrations, they were to learn how to survive here in the Southwest. Um, they would gain knowledge that would sustain future generations. Uh, they would learn about medicine. They would develop um, traditional and ceremonial religious cycles that would give us the ability to anticipate and learn and know how to live here in this arid desert that we now inhabit. So, you know, the, the, the short version is that, okay, the clans came together and we ended up here on Hopi, which was our, our prophesied land, so to speak. You know, we were, we are where we are because that's where we were always intended to be. You know, Hopi's one of the few folks, uh, the few tribes out there, we never signed a treaty with the U.S. government because we were never at war with the U.S. government. When the U.S. government came and found us here on the Three Mesas, that's where we wanted to be. That doesn't mean that's you know, all we wanted to be, but there's a lot more complexities behind that, a lot of politics over the past three, 400 years that come into play with that. So, so you're looking at this large landscape, right? And there's all these waterways that um, traverse. And when we look at these rivers, you know, I always tell people when they see me as a, as a Hopi River guide, they, they're curious as to how did you become to be on this boat, on this river, knowing that Hopi as a people, we don't have a huge boating tradition. <laughs> right? um, in our history, there's one guy that did it all, right? And it relates to this story from the Snake Clan about a young boy growing up on the banks of a river. And so I always tell people that Hopis have always been along the river, not so much on the river, right? So, and that's true when you travel any waterway and as an archeologist, those where the sites are located. Of course, they're located all over, but there's a huge concentration along these various waterways. So how is it that I, as a Hopi person, uh, chose to you know, embark upon this career path or, or part of this as my career? And again, it's just because I was able to figure out how to combine my academic training with my cultural upbringing and I'll use that in an ability, in a forum of public education. So I feel like I've kind of come full circle in many ways in, in my career now, and I'm trying to figure out the different avenues that I can take because I was a Park Service employee first. For eight years, I worked for NPS. I was a federal employee. Then I was a tribal employee, and then now I'm an independent consultant. And now much of my work is going into the realm of nonprofit work. And so I've had all of these different experiences in learning how to combine those facets of, of my upbringing and my education and my training to do the things that I do now. So that's, that's where it comes down to. So part of this talk is about why, why is it relevant for me as a Hopi person, right? Is it just so that I can get paid? to take strangers down a river for X number of days? Is it just so that I can go out for myself and see archaeology out there? It's part of that, you know, but the other part of it now is, is, is bringing it back home, right? So when I was first started out in, in 2007 as a river guide, um, there was probably a handful of other Hopis. There was maybe three or four of us working in various aspects of river guiding. To one, for one reason or another, some of those, some of those guys, they're no longer doing this type of work. When you look at the numbers as a whole, in terms of how many native river guides are there working in the industry, so we'll, we'll use the Colorado River, the commercial industry there as an example. There are probably three to 400 river guides, commercial river guides employed by six or seven, eight commercial companies at this time. Maybe 3% of that number, we'll, say, we'll pick the high number, 400. Maybe 3% of those are native or minority people working as river guides. When you get down to the, the, the finer details of native guides, that number is even smaller. So for me, I can count on my one hand the number of native guides that I know, right, that I work with, you know, from season to season. And so part of our goal in being out there is to help uh, recruit, train, and ultimately retain natives who are interested in pursuing this type of work. 
it's more than just rowing a boat though, right? I mean, I won't lie. I, I thoroughly enjoy getting on my boat every morning, pushing off into the water, knowing that we are going to go somewhere down river. And sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easy, sometimes the wind's blowing, sometimes it snows, it rains. It's not always, you know, a pleasant adventure, but it, it challenges you in that regard. And it reminds you that those folks, my ancestors that were living out in that landscape, they were experiencing that every single day. And here I am getting paid to do this type of work. So I thoroughly enjoy my, my, my work when I'm out there. I enjoy talking to people when I'm out there. I like knowing that I am brought upon some of these trips so that I can help better educate and provide a, a better understanding to folks like you about who my ancestors are and who they were and ultimately where they have ended up at. So that's one part of it, you know, and, and again, I always have to give credit to the folks that train me, not just in the park service, not just in my academic uh, training, but my aunts and uncles back home who always, I was never really taught to withhold all this information. You know, we're very, um, we're, we, we give freely of what we know to a certain point, right? There, there are cultural and personal boundaries that I as an individual Hopi cannot cross. And so you have to recognize those things. And it's a challenge from day to day, from trip to trip, how much you share with a certain group. Where those boundaries become even fuzzier is when you're with your own people. So part of what we do now is taking other folks from our home down the river. And so that's part of the relevance of why I feel like it's important for a person like me to not only do the work I do, but also go out to Hopi, uh, go out to the other native communities and find those natives who are interested in doing this line of work. The interesting part about being on the river is that no matter what you do in life, the river provides you an opportunity to learn more about that specific field that you're studying. It gives you an ability to uh, show other folks what you're doing, right? If you're a scientist, if you're a uh, musician, if you're an artist, uh, if you're a philosopher, if you're a bum, you know, it gives you the opportunity to share uh, your life's experience with a group of people that you may have, you, may have never met and you may never see again, but that's the beauty about being on the river is it's an equalizer for everybody. And so when we go out and we seek to find these native students, that's what we're bringing to the table in that, you know, yeah, I've been doing this now for over 10 years, right? So I kind of feel like uh, I can get comfortable in my line of work. And so some people may look at that and say, well, I don't know if I can get to that point. Well, I didn't get to this point in one day, right? It took me this many years to get here. And I continually learn every day. Every time I get on the water, I'm learning something new. There's something, a new guide is always teaching me how to rig my boat, how to do this, how to do that. And so it's real important for us to show to our native folks that, hey, you know, you can come to this with zero experience. And what you're bringing to the table is your ability to be a native person. Your ability to say that I belong here, that my ancestors were here, so I have a right to be here. It's not just for the wealthy. It's not just for those folks that can pay X thousands of dollars for a commercial trip, right? And there's some difficulties in that, of course, in trying to put together a program where we allow native people to go down the river, but it does happen. So let me talk a little bit about that because I think it really showcases some of the strides we've been able to make. Maybe 10 years ago, right, when I first did my river trip, 2002, over 10 years now, and we would stop and I would go listen to the other commercial guides give their talk about archeology, span about native people. You know, you'd get the full spectrum of lies and truths mixed in together about somebody's interpretation. And I would sit there in the background and kind of cringe about you know what was being taught to the folks that were coming down the river and it didn't always sit well with me and so I took it upon myself to be able to say well if I'm going to be doing this type of work um, it, it's my responsibility to provide the most correct and accurate 
truthful representation of who I am as a Native American, as a Hopi person. And so that really has been kind of a movement within a lot of commercial companies, within the Park Service, within the Forest Service, in that they really strive nowadays to include the Native perspective in all of their uh, interpretive materials. You know, consultation is a huge part of what we do uh, in our line of work as Native archaeologists, anthropologists, ethnographers, whoever. When our interactions involve outside entities, we want to be at the table and be able to say that this is who we are, this is how we think this should be interpreted, this is the type of information we want you to put on your pamphlet, on your information sign. And so that has increased the quality, that has upped the quality of what folks, visitors coming to these places are learning about. You know, a lot of folks come on these trips having only seen Dances with Wolves, right? Or something like that, where there's that type of native and they have that image stuck in their head that you folks are still living way back here in the past. So yeah, some of us, some of that, our life is back here. It is, it is rooted in the past, it has to be. But we're just like you all, we're living in 2016 on a daily basis and so it's our job. This, I view this as a two-way street, you know, that I have to be willing to communicate some of this accurate representation to you all. And so the Park Service is going to be one good example. And, and yes, I have an affinity for the Park Service because maybe I spent a lot of time there, but a lot of my friends still work there, you know, and they're involved in the, in the good work that's going on. And so you know, through some of the work with the Park Service, we've been able to um, provide some of this meaningful consultation. I was involved in another program. Can you hand me those? I'll pass these around real quick. Thank you. And um, there was a program. It's still, it's still in existence. Maybe it's not as good as it was since, you know, a few of us left. But um, back in the day, it was called Native Voices on the Colorado River, right? And... Um, it was a program sponsored by the commercial river guiding companies on the Grand Canyon. And they put up money to help sponsor um, a program in which we could gather from all the affiliated tribes associated with Grand Canyon, 11 affiliated tribes, what they thought was correct and respectful information about who they are as a people. And so we spent a great deal of time. We spent three, four, five years working to gather various information, going to sit with tribal members and recording them, interviewing them, having group meetings where they could come together and provide information and then critique and edit what they said and make sure that they felt comfortable with it. Ultimately, our, our goal was to have some information that was, you know, fairly succinct. You know, it wasn't too heavy. Um, these little one-page deals are double-sided. And I only brought four. There's, there's one for every tribe um, affiliated with the Grand Canyon. And um, I'll just go ahead and pass these around and feel free to look at them. But what, what it was meant to do, it was really meant for the river guides, right? It was really meant for the commercial guides working out there so that we could give them a one-page deal and they could stick it in their ammo can or whatever. Their company could have it and they could then have something, at least a little bit of information, right? They can't have me on every trip, although I'd like to be on every trip, but that's just not the reality of it. They could at least have some kind of information available that they could then pass to their customers and they would get some uh, idea of who we are. It wasn't much, but it was something more that was, it was more than what was available at the time. And so another component of that was providing um, audio and video, right? Interviews and video of tribal members and speaking about who they are as a, as a, as a person, as an indigenous person. So in 2011, you know, one of the greatest parts, joys, things that I could ever wish for being a river guide is we were able to put together a river trip in the Colorado River with members of these various tribes and take them down and record them in their in their traditional places, you know. So we had representatives from Navajo, Hopi, Havasupai, Supai, Wallapai, and then later on Zuni and Paiute would, would come on board. And so we had all these folks on one boat, you know, bunch of natives going down the river. You know, it was like, you know, you could see the fear of all the other groups as this boat came cruising down the river, right? 
No, I'm just kidding. Very well respected people, very well mannered. Everybody, you know, you know, had a good time. And it was one of those things where we were able, maybe at, some of us knew each other. So there was some camaraderie there. Some of us were total strangers. We didn't know who that person was, who this person was. And so just like, just like any other river trip, there's that period of a couple of days at the very beginning where you kind of have to figure out who these people are. Am I going to enjoy being on the river with this person for X number of days? 11 days it turned out to be, 12 days, right? And so we were no different than any other commercial group coming down the river. We had to figure out one another and we had to learn and listen from one another. And so that was one of the greatest experiences of sitting around the campfire every night. Somebody would be chosen or volunteer to tell a story, some aspect of Maybe it was traditional knowledge. Maybe it was just a personal narrative about who they were as a person. Um, every night, somebody had that opportunity to do so. And so for 10 nights, you know, we did that. Until the final night, we all kind of had that final gathering of sharing about what have we garnered from this. And today, you know, unfortunately, for many reasons, there's a lot of political tension between some of the tribes. That's just the reality of it, and that's never going to go away. Um, some of it is the fault of us, some of it we'll blame on the government, and some of it maybe we'll just, we never know why. But there's always going to be that tension out there. But for that period of time, we were able to come together as a group and share experiences and knowledge that showed that we all had some connection, some tie to that Grand Canyon landscape, that Colorado River. It meant something to each and every one of us every single one of us was just one representative from that group. But that one representative was able to speak volumes about what their home group felt about this landscape. And so, you know, for me, that, that was a great example about, out of that, you know, people ask me, well, how did you continue to be a river guide and how do I do it? And so another component is we're still striving to continue that Native American guide, river guide training program that I first spoke about. It was from 2007 to about 2011, it was going pretty strong. We were able to uh, train over 60 Native students in this program, some of whom who have continued to go on to guiding today, um, some who wanted to try it and maybe never went back again. But the, the point is, is that um, we were able to give those students the experience of experiencing their homeland from a different perspective. Some of the students we bring down the river have never been camping, as ironic as it may seem for a native kid. A lot of them come from inner cities like here, you know, Phoenix. They've never seen a full starry night sky. And so for them to be able to experience that totally blows their mind. Or maybe they only get that when they go off, you know, into the reservation and it's for a short amount of time, but they're still exposed to the modern day, you know, everyday TV and all that stuff. But when you're out there, you get a different perspective of what it is to be native. You actually see those landscapes for the first time. And so that's, you know, one of the things that my father impressed upon me is that we hear the stories, we sing the songs, we say the prayers about this place over here. Maybe in our mind's eye, we kind of know what it looks and feels like. But you'll never really understand what that place is until you go there in person and you experience it firsthand. And so part about being a river guide is it allows us to go and visit some of these farther off the path places that we may only have a story about, you know. We may only sing about in a song. We may only pray about it. And so you actually go there and it brings to your mind's eye, your personal experience, a whole greater range of emotions and feelings and connection. It allows, you know, much like when I was a little kid and my dad or somebody would say, you are related to this person, I had no idea what he meant. So nowadays when I tell these younger kids, well, yeah, that's the reservation, but you're connected to this much greater landscape, they don't understand that, how is it? And so by exposing them to these landscapes, they're given that opportunity to really see and feel and hear and know how they are connected to it. And so through the various work that we do, whether it's 
whether I'm just a sole Indian on a trip or I'm working with a boat full of natives, our goal is one and the same, and that's really to educate and help share some of this knowledge so that you know, we as, as native people continue to remember and understand you know, our stories and history that are tied into you know, much greater landscape than what you see on the, on the map today. So um, I'll close with, you know, with the kind of bring it back home to the Hopi side of things. And Hopi is really fortunate. Um, you know, there's that first Hopi story, or the story of the first Hopi guy that went down the river. I always ask people, you know, was he the last? Fortunately, he wasn't the last. Many Hopis go down the river every year. Some of us have been down on these uh, Hopi cultural trips. And so because we're cooperating partners with the National Park Service, the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, and other federal agencies, we're allotted a certain amount of funds to fund a trip uh, of Hopi males, and there's a cultural reason why only Hopi males are allowed to go down the river. Um, it's not gender discrimination, it's rooted in, in tradition. Although some females are, for their own reasons, are challenging that. It's not for me to tell them they can't go down the river, it's just a part of our tradition. But for the time being on these Hopi cultural trips, it's the males that go down, initiated males, usually 17 and older. And so we get on the boat and we go down and it's a much different trip, you know, like uh, it's not a commercial trip. We're there to learn, we're there for cultural uh, purposes. We're there to reconnect these males to a place that they may have, again, only heard about in story, song, and prayer. And so, you know, for, the, for over 20 years, the Hopi tribe has been doing this trip annually. Um, and out of that, we've been able to amass a huge amount of information. You know, we're not just there to sightsee. We're there to actually do our own research. You know, we come armed with our own research questions. Who are we as a people? What does our history say about this place? How can we learn more about it? And so when we come on these cultural trips, it's about deepening our understanding from a, a, both a, a metaphorical and, and literal perspective. You know, we are down in the depths. But when you're down there, your understanding is increased uh, exponentially because you're exposed to these landscapes. And so we're down there talking about the plants. We're down there talking about the animals. We're down there asking serious questions about how the water releases from Glen Canyon Dam affect these resources. How are they eroding the beaches? How are they impacting archaeological sites? We're asking tough questions of the government because their actions are causing impacts to our cultural resources. And out of that, we're able to come home with information that we can then present, um, argue our cause, so to speak, with the federal agencies. We're also coming home with all types of information that we can share with our own people. So we're able to take that information and put it into manuals uh, that the Hopi Culture Preservation Office has been working on in terms of documenting the different types of cultural resources that we have down there. And so people are able to see that, um, you know, a good example is, so we may have only heard of a place a classic example is Vasey's Paradise, right? There's a, a, sp a natural spring that comes out of the wall there, the red wall. For many people, they've heard this story associated with it. And they may have never seen it in their life, but when they see it, their mental image of what that place should look like fits the physical reality. And so they're able to see it firsthand. We come to the canyon armed with all of this cultural knowledge about who we are, our cultural continuity, it's, you know, covers many, many centuries, and so we come with an understanding of how our ancestors lived. So when the Park Service decided to do some excavations uh, a few years back, right there in their archaeological excavation pits was Hopi history, shining brightly, right? We knew that that stuff was going to be there based on our understanding, and so we're able to provide some uh, reinforcement of Hopi history. So for all these men that are able to go down what they're doing is they're providing the greater Hopi public with a greater understanding of what the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River means to us as Hopi people. We're then able to turn that around and take that into schools. Uh, we're able to the general Hopi public so that they understand 
for many Hopi people, they may go to Lee's Ferry or we go to the rim and we look down, but we may not ever venture into that other landscape. And so we may not be able to really fathom what is down there, right? And so through this type of work, both being a river guide and being a river participant, you know, you're able to bring these two kind of realms together and present it, you know, to, to a, a greater population out there so that folks out home have a greater understanding of what it is that we're doing. So, um, how much time we have? Okay, well, I just want to make sure because <laughs> we're always on a deadline on these things. So, um, you know, um, for me personally, that, that's kind of where my life stands in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm grateful, you know, Bill uh, chose to call me a young man. Uh, cool, you know. <laughs> I'm 41 years of age, which, you know, you know, for me is good. You know, I feel right about where I'm supposed to be. Um, it's taken me a long time, 10 years or more, to really kind of understand why I chose to be an archaeologist. You know, I tell this story, you know, I... I told everybody I was in a ditch college, right? And so they all expected me to, to never go back. And so all of a sudden, there I am back in college and uh, go home again, sitting around the dinner table. My aunt, you know, asked me, well, what are you doing? And I told her, well, I'm back in school, right? And, um, oh, cool, okay, that's fine. Well, what are you studying? Uh, archaeology. <laughs> that was the silence, right? <laughs> Nobody could believe it. Nobody could believe it. I would pursue a career in a profession that has a stigma attached to it. You know, from the, from the native perspective, anthropologists, archaeologists, ethnographers, you know, they're the bad guys. They're the grave robbers. They came and built careers off of our ancestors and then left. That's all they did. And so for my family, that was their stigma attached to it. And so I had to work. I had to work at it, not just for myself. You know, I, I had that stigma going into it as well. I was very apprehensive. I wasn't certain that I had made the right decision. As I went through coursework, as I went through field schools, as I garnered more training, I became more and more comfortable. But it was also my duty to turn around and take that understanding back home. So I was constantly relating to my family. This is what we're doing. This is what I'm learning. This is what I'm involved in. And I'm fortunate again, uh, you know, at least in, in Hopi, we have a program, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office, that has been at the forefront of really being in heavily involved in this type of work, being collaborative, um, being very adamant about we have a voice in whatever the government is planning to do with our cultural, our ancestral history. And so hand in hand, we were working to increase our public understanding about this is what we are doing. One of my biggest uh, critics at that dinner table was my father. Even though he, was, he grew up on the landscape, even though he was a rancher, even though he was a farmer, he did not want me to become an archaeologist. He was content when I told him, I'm not going back. He was content to say, you, you know, you stick with construction, you'll do fine there. That's what he had done. So for those 10 or more years, I had to work my father, work him over, so to speak. I would tell him what we were doing. I would take home archaeological reports, read this, put that Western horseman down, read this, you know. <laughs> Over that course of time, he started to turn his uh, perspective around. He started to become more interested, more interested, wanting to learn more. Take him out to the ranch, teaching him, you know what, this, it's not just pottery. Th th these have names. They, these will tell you information. Taking him out to the ranch, see this rock art, this has meaning behind it. He had gotten that as a child, but because of the stigma attached to these sciences, he chose not to bring the two together, right? And so here we are in 2016. I cannot keep my dad 
out of an archaeology site. <clears throat> he is now a part of what we call the Cultural Resource Advisory Task Team out at Hopi. These are a group of men. And Saul will attest to the, what these gentlemen do. These are the giants out at Hopi. Not because they're powerful. Not because they're know-it-alls. They bring to the table a wealth of information that we're able to share, that are able to teach guys like me to come back and teach younger folks, other people out there. And so um, that's kind of the full circle, you know, that we've come to in that this is the importance. This is what I've learned, right? Sometimes when you're on the river, it's real easy to row. You have those days where it's just mile after mile. And you know you're going to make the next camp, no sweat. Then there are those days when it gets really hard, when the wind blows and it blows. And no matter how hard you row, you're not making miles downstream. You have to turn your boat around, you have to turn your hat around, you have to put your head down, and you just start rowing as hard as you can. Eventually, you get to some point down the river. And uh, those are the days that I remember the most, not because they were the best days, not necessarily because they were the hardest days, but simply because they reminded me of why I'm there. It's because I chose to be there as a person. I'm learning things as I go through this career. I'm given the opportunity to come through those hard times and really um, feel like maybe there's some purpose to this decision I made a long time ago. And so um, I think we'll leave it with that. And, uh, open it up for questions, so thanks for your time. Um, I have a couple questions for you. Was your father a product of boarding schools? Did he get taught to be ashamed of being Hopi? The other question is, is there a comparable experience for girls who have uh, reached, you know, coming of age things? Is there something for them that's different from the river experience for the boys? Um, my, maybe my father grew up uh, not so much. He, you know, he, he was born in 42, somewhere around there. So maybe his experience wasn't so harsh as what some of the other boarding school experiences were. Um, he doesn't really speak about it either, you know. So maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It didn't prevent him so much from, um, you know, wanting better for his kids, so to speak, it, asking us to continue to go to school. And so um, my, my father doesn't really lean one way or the other that he had a bad time in school, you know, any more than anybody else. For the, for the females, um, again, so there's this cultural rule in Hopi about females going down the Grand Canyon, the Colorado River. And it's not because, uh, again, like I said, it has nothing to do with gender discrimination. It really comes down to the cultural foundation that you're making that perspective, that you're making that assumption out of. You know, in Hopi, males are kind of expendable. Females are up here. We're, we're a matrilineal society. So they own the property, they own the fields, they are the caretakers of the house. Uh, we follow our mother's line. And so they are given special status in that. There's a lot of cultural and spiritual uh, aspects of the Grand Canyon that have maybe <clears throat> uh, a danger associated with it. And so it's about putting somebody that you place a high value on as a person in harm's way. It's better to send us guys down there where, you know, we're exposed. It's like, who are you going to expose to the radiation? You know, kind of, and, and it's a weak metaphor, but um, that being said, there are Hopi females who choose to go down the Colorado River. You know, when my sister got married in 2002, she married a white guy who was a river guide. And so I, that was fine with me. She came to me and said, well, you know, for our honeymoon, he wants to take me down the river. I need you to 
we need to talk about this. And so her and my dad and we sat down and we had a long conversation about this. And it uh, really comes down to what your intentions are in terms of going down there, right? Um, ultimately, we said, okay, that's fine. You know, we'll do that. So we drove to the Grand Canyon and I hiked my sister down to Phantom Ranch, put her on the boat, said later, and that was it, you know. Since then, she's gone down again and there are a handful of Hopi women who have chosen to go down the Colorado River against this cultural taboo, so to speak, the rule. And one of the great things that one of my aunts has told me, she goes, well, there were women down here in the prehistory. Why can't we go down now? That's really not for me to, to argue with. Um, some Hopi men will say, well, that's the, that's the agreement we entered into when we became Hopi, so to speak. And so it's up to them how they choose to interpret that. So we do do a separate trip uh, for Hopi females up on the San Juan River. And so they are given that experience to get out there and, and um, see what these cultural landscapes are like. And so they are, uh, they do have that. And there's, there's other things in, in the culture that both males and females do um, that, you know, allow them to have, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, coming of age, so to speak. But so there's, there's that. Could you differentiate between the various rivers that fall within that area on the map? Sure, we'll try to. I know it's kind of hard and, um, and it cuts it off right here. This is f way up here on this left side here is pretty much, you know, the Grand Canyon, the Colorado River here. So we're gonna call this area right in here what, what you see on the map is, as today's Hopi Reservation. So you have this. We have the Colorado River, the Little Colorado River. We have the San Juan River coming in. Um, they're not really shown down here. We have the Verde River. And way down here we have the Salt and Gila River. Okay. And then over here in New Mexico, uh, we have the Rio Grande. And up here in Colorado, uh, we have the Animus River. And so there's a, a half dozen different major rivers. Um, and of course, there's much more streams and creeks and those kinds of things. But these are kind of the major ri river systems within what we would consider ancestral land. And so we have names for those rivers. Uh, we have different associations with those rivers uh, based on stories and songs and prayers. And so that connection kind of is very specific to those rivers and in, in what they mean and what purpose they hold. Um, some guys will collect water from various rivers uh, for use in ceremonies back home. And so a certain ceremony may require you go to this river to get that water and bring it back. And so, um, yeah, those are those there. Did I answer your question? Can you s say from your viewpoint how you feel about the possibility of there being gondolas built down into the <laughs> confluence. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, something that is, of course, near and dear to my heart um, in terms of this issue of this proposed uh, Escalade project there at the confluence of the Little Colorado and Colorado River there at the Grand Canyon. From the Hopi perspective, of course, we are 100% against it for many reasons, many of which are tied into cultural history. Um, those reasons cannot be divided or watered down in any way. Our, our connection and importance of this area remains strong to this day. The reality of it is that this is not our land, politically now. This land is under the jurisdiction of both the National Park Service and the Navajo Nation. So our say in it is limited to kind of the outer realm of, of, those, of that system, of that process. It doesn't mean that we're going to not be vocal about it. Uh, we have chosen to be very vocal about it. We have chosen to make it known that we are against it for, again, cultural reasons. Um, but also from the standpoint of, of what maybe, you know, the Grand Canyon Trust or Sierra Club or other environmental organizations is that this is still a pristine landscape that deserves to be kept in that manner. 
just you know a week ago, um, we had a presence there when the Navajo Nation had their hearings uh, about this issue, and both our chairman and and our director of the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office uh, were allowed to make statements, or at least made a statement about it, um, stating again our opposition. And so, I don't. I of course can say I hope that never comes to pass. You know, and this is a huge part of what I do when I'm down there, is we spend a great deal of time at the LCR confluence talking about this issue, educating all those folks that are on the boat, you know, and it's kind of a heavy topic, but it's part of the trip that we need to educate folks down there. So, um, no, we, we, we hope to, to not see this happen. And so we will continue to um, voice our opposition to it. We will continue to look for those allies that are out there that will help support our position. And so, you know, at this point, that's pretty much where, where we're at on this. So we just hope and pray that, yeah, it has a, a better outcome. You had uh, been talking about uh, your father and understanding uh, your choice as an archaeologist. And, and um, as technology advances and the, the, um, the lands are, are more open to um, our modern you know, technology and our younger generations and the travel is a little easier and those things. How is your cultural preservation um, you know, taking the sort of journey that you took to say archeology span a somewhat forbidden or, or, or you know, looking at a, as a, as a, a caustic um, view of, of your culture how, how, are, how is your youth um, interacting with the cultural preservation of like your father now? Is that increasing? Is that saying the same? Is it, is it, is it, is it, is it a, I'm just trying to, I, I don't have a good question for you. I'm just trying to sure. formulate, you know, it, it, uh, is, is the Hopi tribe with the cultural preservation and things like archeology, span is it becoming a better landscape or, or, or how is that changing for you? I, I think that, you know, of course, I'm always going to be an optimist on, on this and say that um, I see that there is an increase amongst uh, the younger generations in understanding the importance of, of cultural history from that actual physical interaction, you know, perspective on it. Um, Students out home are exposed to this in many ways, you know, within the school systems now. And so there are some programs that talk about, you know, archaeology as a career. Um, folks like myself and other, you know, archaeologists from out home uh, do go into the schools and show kids what we do, how it can become a career. Um, so I would, I would, I feel that there's, there's always an uptrend to what that understanding and, and outlook looks like. You know, that uh, if we continue to be diligent in this, if we continue to be transparent and sharing with our information amongst ourselves, that will have positive beneficial impacts to our younger generation. Again, they're, they're being inundated just like any other kids out there, you know. Um, they're more so. Um, for many years, our isolation protected us. Now our isolation kind of works against us in many ways because they may, they may think that there's not too many opportunities out there for them. Um, so it's a constant, you know, struggle to show students, show younger generations. And a lot of our time is focused on the younger generations, but there's a whole segment of the Hopi population 20 or more, 20 years or, or older, that are sometimes left out <clears throat> of the discussion. <clears throat> and they need to be continually brought into that as well. So there's, it's not just focusing on the youth and elderly, but there's also that focusing on the middle generation that may feel kind of lost sometimes about they're not getting this attention. They don't have those services. What are we supposed to do with ourselves? And so it's about, you know, kind of reaching those, all those um, segments of the population. But at least when it comes to the youth component, I think there is uh, a lot of upswing uh, in that <clears throat> language retention is, is a lot better right now. Um, some of, again, the cultural histories are being taught within the schools and that information is, is available for them. 
maybe not so much again like with my father's generation. So um, they're continually reminded about what a Hopi is and who they are and how they should be growing up. And hopefully that sticks with them into their later years and allows them to choose paths that, you know, are reflective of, you know, that upbringing, so. I'm wondering how you as a Hopi deal with the questions that come, comes up sometimes from the general public um, on your trips when they ask you uh, something about the cultural landscape, but it's more of a generic question and there may be the expectation or maybe an unspoken expectation that you answer for not only Hopi but other tribes as well. Um, that can be an issue, I understand, in some circles. And I was wondering, have you, with the other uh, tribes that have, are participating in this uh, river, uh, these river expeditions, do they have an understanding that, you know, we'll only speak about our own tribes and not the others, or is there permission given to do that? I'm, I'm curious because a lot of people kind of generalize the mm -hmm. lay public and they'll ask questions that they think that the answers apply to all tribes when of course they don't. Yeah, that, that issue comes up a lot. Um, what I tell folks is that I, I represent m my experiences as an individual. I cannot speak for uh, everybody at Hopi, you know, and that I think, you know, even, even if it wasn't involved uh, with speaking to the public, internally within Hopi, there are cultural boundaries. We don't speak about other clans that we're not a member of. Uh, we don't speak about other societies or whatever that we're not a member of. Those are for them to speak about. So when it comes to the public realm, we, we do have to generalize in the sense that, okay, maybe I am representing one Hopi viewpoint, one perspective. And it's, it's, it's hard to know what that pers how that person is taking it. Are they going to take it specifically as that or are they going to generalize it? Uh, for all Hopi people. There are some answers that, yeah, maybe you can generalize some things that are relati relatively specific, you know, in their, in their answers. When it comes to the intertribal part, I, I think it's well known that we don't speak for other tribes. Um, I think that comes out very clearly um, in some of these intertribal groups that we have, not just on the river, but with other, uh, you know, consultation meetings where there's multiple members from different tribes there we are all representing that tribe, uh, but we're not speaking for one another in, in that because we do have different perspectives on things. Um, some of them aren't, don't always jive with one another. And so that's just the, the reality of it. And so I think it's very well understood that uh, at that level, at least that no, we're not, I'm not speaking as a Zuni or as a Navajo or as a Wallapai. I'm speaking from the Hopi perspective and that's, that's the compartmentalization of, of our interaction, so. <laughs> I've noticed in the field of rock art that there are a lot of people, because I belong to the American Rock Art Research Association, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people, even today, the ones who go out and document a site, who still have no idea that this site's different from that one because it's a different group of people. I've met people within that organization, well, an Indian's an Indian, and that's not true. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, and you've probably run into this one, that, um, and when I was a kid, an Indian had feathers. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't wearing feathers, you weren't Indian. And I'm sure a lot of people in this country have ideas like that, and they, you probably meet them, don't you? <laughs> yeah, there's, um, you know, the, the field of rock art research is pretty interesting. Uh, you, you get the, full spectrum of interpretation and who it represents and what it represents. Um, and you throw in an archaeological perspective of this is Sanawa versus Ancestral Puebloan versus Hohokam versus whoever else, you know, it, it does muddy the water uh, a little bit. You know, we always fall back and, and maybe not that's not the right way to put it, but we, we rely on our understanding that we weren't Hopi up until recently. That's a term that is a, a, a realization of a lifestyle that came about that was built up over the centuries. And so what we were before then was clans. And that's who we always are. 
And so with however many number of clans traversing the landscape, you may get, you will get those variations and similarities of rock art spread over a wide region. And so, um, you know, that, that again, that's that kind of uh, the dual perspective of archaeology, science versus tradition and indigenous folks coming together in, in trying to understand something as, you know, abstract as rock art. You know, I, I for one, never try really attempt to decipher rock art. There's some meanings in there that are generalization to a certain level, but when, you know, you start to try and tell a, a story out of something that is 800 years old, uh, you may or may not be hitting on that mark. And so, um, yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to say that, no, this is just one group representation represented here when you know from the cultural background that um, there were multiple groups comprising multiple people, you know, and so who we are as Hopi, some of our clans ended up elsewhere. And so just because on a map it says Hopi and we identify ourselves as a Hopi tribe, that is a, a, a designation that we've given ourselves in a in recent time, I guess you could say, you know, so it, it does cause some confusion in terms of, you know, who made what, where, when, and why. Thank you, Lyle. This has been, as usual, an incredible <clears throat> presentation. Imagine spending five or six days with Lyle, uh, the Mounds and Migrants Tour <laughs> this spring. Um, handouts in the back. So thanks to, again. Let's give Lyle one big round of, hand, of applause. Thank you.